welcome back to Wednesday night uh, church, we'll say, our Wednesday night Bible study as we continue to journey through the Gospel of Matthew. I really miss Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard uh, passed away a few years ago. Uh, he's a man whose writings just had a great impact and continue to have a great impact on my life. Dallas Willard was actually ordained a Southern Baptist minister, but he's best known as a philosopher associated with the University of Southern California. And he's be better known, I should say best known, uh, for his writings on Christian spiritual formation. Unusual thing to have an ordained Southern Baptist minister be at one time the head of the School of Philosophy at Southern Cal. But he was an amazing mind, a great mind, wrote a number of just groundbreaking books in the area of spiritual formation and what it meant to follow Jesus. I think if you were to, to try to summarize Dallas Willard's uh, central driving thesis, it would be this, that the Christian life must be a life of actual discipleship, actually following Jesus. And his belief and argument through all of his books in different ways was that we can actually follow Jesus. For this reason, Willard was uh, really grieved at the absence of an emphasis on discipleship, uh, on actual followership in the church today. I think one of the most painful books I, I, I've ever read is Dallas Willard's book, The Great Omission, which is clearly a play off of uh, The Great Commission of Matthew 28. The Great Omission in the church, according to Willard, is the omission of discipleship. We have omitted discipleship from the Christian life, according to Dallas Willard. I'd like to just share with you a few statements from different points in that book to, to kind of let you understand what his concern was. For instance, quote, who among Christians today is a disciple of Jesus in any substantive sense of the word disciple? The governing assumption today among professing Christians is that we can be Christians forever and never become disciples. Later in the book, so the greatest issue facing the world today with all its heartbreaking needs is whether those who, by profession or culture, are identified as Christians will become disciples, students, apprentices, practitioners, of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of the heavens into every corner of human existence. Here's another statement. Most problems in contemporary churches can be explained by the fact that members have never decided to follow Christ. Let me give you another Discipleship is a term that has pretty well lost its meaning because of the way it has been misused, Willard writes. Discipleship on the theological right has come to mean preparation for soul winning under the direction of parachurch efforts that had discipleship farmed out to them because the local church really wasn't doing it. On the left, discipleship has come to mean some form of social activity or social service, from serving soup lines to political protests to whatever, he says. The term discipleship has currently been ruined so far as any solid psychological and biblical content is concerned. Wow. Ouch. Is Willard right? Has discipleship, in any sort of meaningful way, been removed or omitted from the Christian life? Well, to get at that, we should take a look at how Jesus called his disciples to follow him. In the words of Christ and his call to the disciples, we can discover what discipleship is. And we find that at the end of Matthew 4. Our text is Matthew 4, 18 to 22. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, 
and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So what do these verses reveal to us about the nature of Christian discipleship? I think a few things. Number one, it reveals that discipleship is the prioritizing of Jesus and his path. Discipleship, number one, is the prioritizing of Jesus and his path. It is putting Jesus and his path, his way, above every and all other concerns. Now, one of the ways to define discipleship is to take this text in which Jesus calls the disciples and ask ourselves if there are any words that repeat. Repetition is usually a sign of emphasis. So consider the following three verses from 19, 20, and 22 and see if you can spot the repeated word or words or phrase. Verse 19, and he said to them, follow me. Verse 20, and they left their nets and followed him. Verse 22, they left the boat and their father and followed him. That's right. The word follow or some form of it is used three times in those three verses one time for each verse. Follow me, they followed him, and they followed him. So this tells us at its most basic and fundamental level that the definition of discipleship must have something to do with following. Disciples follow the one that they have pledged allegiance to. They follow their master or Lord or rabbi. This is what disciples do. Disciples follow. This rules out from the get-go any sense of static discipleship. Discipleship is not static. It doesn't stay in one place. It's not sedentary. It's not set. It is dynamic. Discipleship moves it follows, it takes up a cross, it walks a path. The earliest Christians were called members of the way, the way of Jesus. The very word had a connotation of discipleship. We walk in his way. Why did Jesus pick these men? I know that J.D. Salinger's novel, The Catcher in the Rye, is not frequently quoted in sermons with good reason, pretty controversial book, but um, an important book in understanding a cultural moment, I think. And in The Catcher in the Rye, there's a fascinating conversation in which uh, Holden Caulfield talks about a friend of his who was a Quaker. His friend is named Childs. And Childs, the Quaker, and Holden Caulfield, they, they have a disagreement over this very question, over the disciples. Here's what Caulfield says, Old Childs was a Quaker and all, and he read the Bible all the time. He was a very nice kid, and I liked him, but I could never see eye to eye to him with him on a lot of stuff in the Bible, especially the disciples. He kept telling me if I didn't like the disciples, then I didn't like Jesus at all, and all. He said that because Jesus picked the disciples, you were supposed to like them. I said I knew he picked them, but that he picked them at random. I said he didn't have time to go around analyzing everyone. I said I wasn't blaming Jesus or anything. It wasn't his fault that he didn't have any time. Well, that's kind of a fascinating and charming approach to the disciples. It's extremely muddled. H however we understand the mysteries of election and God's sovereign call of us, it is clear that God called these 12 men to come and follow him. The Lord Jesus called them. And however we understand the mysteries of the whole dynamic between 
God's sovereign call and human responsibility, the whole question of whether or not they could have said no. We know that certainly people did say no to Jesus. But however we try to understand that whole dynamic, what's happening behind the scenes, the disciples did not say no. They said yes. So however we might view this, we certainly can't see Jesus' call as, quote, random in the way we think of the word random. Jesus wasn't time crunched and time pressed, and so he had to panic and do the best he could without, quote, analyzing these men. It's, it's almost as if in The Catcher in the Rye, Holden Caulfield is suggesting that had Jesus had more time, he would have done a more thorough study of the men that he called. No, he, he intended to call the men that he called, and they followed him. And the point is, they said yes, and they followed him. To be a disciple is to follow. Now, we live in a day of what's called nominal Christianity. That is, to be Christian by name. Nominal Christianity is the kind of Christianity that expects to go to heaven, but does not really know what it is to have your life disrupted by actually following Jesus. Nominal Christianity is the very antithesis of discipleship. Nominal Christianity seeks to use Jesus for the benefits that he offers us, but doesn't want to follow Jesus. Nominal Christianity sees the point of Jesus as the life that happens after death, but not the life that happens before death. Nominal Christianity is a plague. Nominal Christianity must be rejected. John Stott put it nicely when he wrote, one wishes in some ways that the word disciple had continued into the following centuries so that Christians were self-consciously disciples of Jesus and took seriously their responsibility to be, quote, under discipline. The two words are, are very similar. Discipline and discipleship both come from a Latin word, discere, that means to learn. Well, I like Stott's suggestion, and I think maybe we should consider doing that. Why shouldn't we resurrect the word disciple as part of our evangelism and missions and life together in the church? When you call someone to come to Christ, why can you not say, instead of or in addition to, will you believe in Jesus? Why can you not say, will you become a disciple of Jesus? After all, that question certainly carries with it the the connotation of faith and belief. Or at the very least, when we call people to believe in Jesus, to put their faith in Jesus, we should say, will you put your faith in Jesus and, and follow him as a disciple? We have got to bring the concept of discipleship back into the language of the church and the language of our missions and evangelism. So to be a disciple is to follow. Secondly, Discipleship is immediate, radical obedience. To be a disciple is to follow, but to be a disciple is also to display immediate, radical obedience. See if you can spot the repetition in these two verses, verses 20 and 22. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Then verse 22 Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Immediately, immediately they followed. When you hear that word, what does it bring to mind? It brings a sense of urgency, a sense of clarity, a sense of intensity. Disciples are people who do not stop and count the cost and ponder over each command that God gives them. They have already counted the cost. They have already determined to take up the cross. They have already decided that Jesus is Lord. Disciples do not ponder. Disciples do not delay. Disciples do not avoid. The disciple has already determined that Christ and Christ alone will determine the, the trajectory of their lives, of his or her life. A disciple is someone who has already 
put his or her yes on the table, to use a phrase that's become very popular today. We put our yes on the table when we take hold of Christ, and in that way, we, sh- we pronounce and announce that Jesus can be trusted to lead our paths, lead us in the path, and then we follow him. This is what it is to be a disciple. Again, John Stott, in his book on radical discipleship, writes, quote, Our common way of avoiding radical discipleship is to be selective, choosing those areas in which commitment suits us and staying away from those areas in which it will be costly. But because Jesus is Lord, we have no right to pick and choose the areas in which we will submit to his authority. Do you do that? Do I? Disciples don't pick and choose the tasks they want. They trust that their master and Lord is sovereign and knows what he is doing when he calls him or her to a particular task. Have we trusted in Christ like that? Immediately. Jesus calls these men in the very middle of their jobs. They're doing their work. He has no regard for our schedule. It's not as if Jesus says, well, let me wait until he he or she is having a little bit of downtime, and then I will call him or her. No, Jesus calls us when he is ready. Will we follow? It's an amazing thing. The call to discipleship is the call to radical immediate obedience. And then finally, discipleship is the reorientation of your life and your giftings toward the kingdom of God. Discipleship is the reorientation of your life and your giftings toward the kingdom of God. It's really fascinating the terminology Jesus used when he calls these fishermen. He says in verse 19, quote, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I think the usage of the word fishers and fishers of men is very important. That tells me that Jesus meets us where we are, and he meets us with us being who we are. He meets us with our personalities and our gifts, the gifts and personalities he's given us. He doesn't He doesn't strip away our giftings. He doesn't strip away what he has made us to be. He does not deconstruct your uniqueness. Rather, he redeems it and reorients it toward the kingdom. So fishers of fish become fishers of men. Do you see how brilliant this is? To come to Jesus is not to stop being you, Rather, it's to give yourself to Christ so that you can be the you you were always intended to be. And what is the you you were always intended to be? It is the you that is shaped like Jesus. It is the you that lives out the values and and the economy of the kingdom of God. You value what God values. You devalue what God devalues. Coming to Jesus means taking who you are and letting him reorient it Godward toward the kingdom. It is bringing everything that you are to Christ so that he can not get rid of it, but that rather he can purge it of our sins and everything that is diminishing us so that we can become the fishermen and women, if you will, that we were supposed to be. He doesn't tell them not to be fishermen. He just tells them that they are now going to be fishers of men or teachers for the kingdom of God or plumbers for the kingdom of God or doctors for the souls of men and women. On and on it goes. Whatever you are, wherever you are, that is where Christ wants to meet you and shape your life for his glory. 
these men don't even fully abandon fishing. They, they fished again later in life. But what used to just be a job or also an interest, mainly a job, but also I have no reason to think they didn't enjoy it, now takes on a kingdom shape and kingdom value. It has weight because it has been pressed into service for the king of kings. That's an awesome thing. To come to Jesus is not to abandon your personality. Rather, it's to have it magnified by the God who made it for his own purposes and for the advancement of his kingdom. I think one of the saddest examples of someone who failed to understand this is the example of Clarence Jordan's brother, Robert. Now, Clarence Jordan was a really fascinating character. He actually uh, was um, a Greek scholar. He was a graduate of Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And in the 1950s, I believe it was, Clarence Jordan started an interracial farming community called Koinonia in southwest Georgia. And I know this because I used to live and pastor not too far from Koinonia. And when we lived in South Georgia, I would on occasion, probably six, seven, eight times over the years, would drive out to Koinonia. There's a museum there of everything that happened. There's a, there's a PBS special about Koinonia you can watch. I believe it's called uh, Briars in the Cotton Patch, maybe. The, the life of Clarence Jordan and what he did there was amazing. He started this interracial farm in the 50s, and he wanted the farm to be um, a test plot, he said, for the kingdom of God. So what he did that got him in so much trouble with people like the Ku Klux Klan was he paid black farmers the exact same thing he paid white farmers. It was a place of equality. It was a place of justice. It was a place in which no one was treated better than anyone else. So you had this Southern Baptist seminary trained Greek scholar down in South Georgia in the deep South in the 50s treating everyone the same. Well, as you might imagine, they were, they were protested. Um, the farm was uh, shot up a number of times by people who would drive by. They were the the clan did a, a long drive by in their cars. There's pictures of this. They were harassed. People wouldn't buy the produce from the farm. They had to start shipping things out of state. I mean, they were banned from businesses and on and on it goes. Well, Clarence Jordan uh, had a brother named Robert Jordan, who was an attorney. Robert Jordan um, would later be a state senator, and he would uh, serve on the Georgia Supreme Court. And at one point, Clarence Jordan asked his brother, Robert, to legally represent Koinonia Farms. And this put his brother in a tight spot. Well, James McClendon, the Baptist theologian, has passed on the conversation that Clarence Jordan of Cornania Farms, Cornania is the Greek word for fellowship, had with his brother Robert Jordan. He asked his brother to legally represent Cornania Farms. Here's how the conversation went. Robert said, Clarence, I can't do that. You know my political aspirations. Why, if I represented you, I might lose my job, my house, everything I've got. We might lose everything too, Bob, said Clarence. It's different for you, said Mr. Robert. Why is it different, asked Clarence. I remember, it seems to me, that you and I joined the church the same Sunday as boys. I expect when we came forward, the preacher asked me about the same question he did you. He asked me, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And I said, yes. What did you say, Robert? I follow Jesus, Clarence, up to a point, his brother said. Could that point by any chance be the cross? Clarence asked. <coughs> That's right, his brother said. I follow him to the cross, but not on the cross. I'm not getting myself crucified. Then I don't believe you're a disciple, 
Clarence told his brother. You're an admirer of Jesus, but not a disciple of his. I think you ought to go back to the church you belong to and tell them you're an admirer, not a disciple. Well, his brother said, well, now, if everyone who felt like I, I do did that, we wouldn't have a church, would we? The question, Clarence said, is, do you have a church? Well, that really gets to the heart of the matter. If you are not a disciple, are you actually a Christian? Does the New Testament have any concept of Christianity without discipleship? If you will not follow Jesus, have you really put your faith in Jesus? If you will not trust in him, have you really embraced him? If you will not follow him, have you really trusted in him? We say that salvation is by faith alone, which is absolutely true. Faith alone saves, but faith that saves is not alone. It manifests itself in discipleship, in walking with Jesus. Imagine with me that any of the men that Jesus initially called, were imagine that they would have said to him, Nah, Jesus, I'm, I'm going to let you save me. I want to go to heaven, but I have no interest in following you. I'm going to stay here and keep doing what I'm doing. Well, Jesus encountered someone like this, the rich young ruler, who would not let go of what Christ called him to let go of. It is a tragic thing to attempt to use Jesus without committing to follow Jesus. So let me ask you a question. Are you a disciple or just an admirer? Do you practice followership? Do you practice radical, immediate obedience? And have you given everything that you are to Christ? I ask the exact same questions of myself. It's a hard question. But I want to tell you something. If you will give your life to Jesus and walk with him, you will find yourself in the midst of an adventure that you never could have imagined otherwise. Following Jesus is an amazing adventure. It can be scary. It can be painful. But it is the path of life. And it is why he came. Embrace the cross. Decide to be a disciple of Christ. Say yes. Put your yes on the table. Go all in, as we might say, and determine to walk with Jesus as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Pray with me. Well, God, we pull away from discipleship because we know it will cost us. We want to be saved. We want to go to heaven. But we cower in fear when you ask us to take up a cross. God, forgive us. Forgive me. Lord Jesus, may there be a reawakening, a rebirth, a resurrection in the area of discipleship in my life and in the life of this church and in the life of Christians the world over. May we see the value and the necessity of following, of saying yes, of immediately dropping our nets so that we can take up the nets of the kingdom. God, make us disciples. Forgive us, O oh God, our hesitancy, our avoidance, our fear. May we follow King Jesus. Make us disciples. Make us disciples. Make me a disciple. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. I pray that the Lord has spoken to your heart and has to mine through his word. I pray we will all be strengthened and convicted to follow Jesus 
in the living of these days. God bless you. Thanks so much for joining us.